In January 1914, Mosley entered the Royal Military College, Sandhurst, but was expelled in June for a riotous act of retaliation against a fellow student. Mosley often recounted that his days at the academy were often spent piling into a car with the other cadets to travel to London and fighting with local hoodlums. At the onset of the Great War, Mosley was commissioned into of the 16th Queen's Lancers, a cavalry regiment, and was stationed in Ireland. Believing that there was little chance of cavalry being used, he sought a more action-filled posting and transferred to the Royal Flying Corps as an observer. Knowing full well his chances of survival were slim, his diaries of the time romanticized the heroic sacrifice and knowledge that in time, no man would return. Mosley wrote to his mother not to grieve if he was killed, as he was sure he would find death a most interesting experience. However, while showing off before his mother at Shoreham Airport in May 1915, he crashed his plane and broke his right ankle. Currently unfit to fly, he was sent to fight on the Western Front. However, his leg failed to heal, and he collapsed at the Battle of Luz. Sent home for further operations, his leg was saved, but Mosley was left with a permanent limp, and by October 1916, it was decided that Lieutenant Mosley was only fit for desk work. Mosley spent much of the rest of the war working in the Ministry of Munitions and later at the Foreign Office. He developed a keen interest in politics and read greatly, but found his political thought cut short in early 1919. Presented with the opportunity to retake his position as an observer in the now-established Royal Air Force, he enthusiastically signed up and ended the war as a qualified pilot and military observer, though he saw relatively little action at the front lines, as he had once hoped. Despite lacking a university degree and ideological grounding, a young Oswald Mosley, 22, embarked on a political career after World War I. He devoured biographies of famous politicians and strategically met leading figures like Winston Churchill. Both conservatives and liberals courted him, but family ties led him to join the conservatives. Mosley's selection for the Harrow seat raised eyebrows. Local critics saw him as an outsider chosen by party headquarters over qualified locals. He faced minimal opposition and won by a massive margin, becoming the youngest MP in Parliament. During his campaign, Mosley met and courted Lady Cynthia Curzon, daughter of the Foreign Secretary. Their whirlwind romance revealed Mosley's ambition. Curzon, initially apprehensive about Mosley's Jewish appearance, ultimately consented to the marriage. Mosley proved to be a maverick conservative. His maiden speech criticized the government, angering party members. He often expressed left-wing views, opposing intervention in Russia and advocating for the unemployed. He saw himself as a progressive champion, rebuilding a nation shattered by war. The turning point came with the Irish issue. Already critical of the British actions there, Mosley's fiery opposition to the Black and Tans and his scathing attacks on Winston Churchill deeply embarrassed the Conservative government. However, his stance earned him praise from the left. Pressure mounted on Mosley to toe the party line. Refusing to be constrained, he declared his independence, sparking outrage within the Harrow Conservative Association. Despite warnings of electoral defeat, Mosley resigned and forced a by-election. His gamble paid off. Mosley, by then popular with the constituency, increased his majority amidst a divided opposition. Free from party shackles, his politics increasingly aligned with the Labour left. Beatrice Webb, a prominent Labour figure, found Mosley impressive and arranged meetings with leading socialists. Mosley, himself converted to socialism, saw a path to power within the Labour Party. He initiated talks on joining their ranks. Mosley's early political journey was a whirlwind of ambition, rebellion, and a search for ideological alignment. Despite lacking traditional qualifications, his charisma and calculated moves propelled him forward, setting the stage for his future political shifts. It became clear which party he needed to join to advance his political career. In December 1922, he applied to join the Labour Party, eliciting an angry reaction from the Liberals. Margot Asquith chastised Mosley, suggesting he could have been the future Liberal leader had he not sided with what she termed the cruel and petty thugs of Labour. Ramsay MacDonald welcomed Mosley's decision, 
hoping his aristocratic background would lend respectability to the Labour Party. Mosley promptly joined the Independent Labour Party, a left-wing pressure group within Labour, and was warmly received by local parties eager to recruit him. Mosley chose to stand in Birmingham Ladywood against Conservative incumbent Neville Chamberlain, scion of the famous Joseph Chamberlain. At a parliamentary hustings, their differing styles were evident, with Chamberlain's aloofness contrasting Mosley's fervour. Despite initial suspicions from some ILP members about his motives, Mosley's campaign gained momentum. His appointment was controversial, with critics arguing Labour should represent the working class, not wealthy individuals. However, Mosley found allies in John Beckett and John Strachey, also from privileged backgrounds. Their collaboration, influenced by economists like John Maynard Keynes, led to proposals for socialism rooted in economic theory. Mosley faced attacks from conservative newspapers, accused of flaunting wealth or adopting a false proletarian image. Nevertheless, he saw such criticism as proof of his effectiveness for the labor cause. The situation took a strange turn when Mosley's estranged father publicly criticized his socialism, suggesting material action over publicity gestures. Despite familial opposition and media scrutiny, Mosley remained committed to his political ideals. In navigating the complexities of his political journey, Mosley forged alliances, faced criticism, and stayed true to his vision for a socialist Britain.